Uh, good morning. So today I'm going to spend the whole day just telling you about this one theorem. Uh, it's not the most famous theorem, but it's a cool theorem. I like it. I'm, I'm excited to do it. This is from 1977, so I'm really taking you back, back in time. Should bring like a disco ball or something to the 70s. Uh, this is the theorem proved by Hopcroft, Paul, and Valiant, and it's been pointed out to me a couple times. It's a little bit confusing because this is the less Valiant, who's probably still Still the most famous Valiant that does theoretical computer science, but he has a son called Paul Valiant that does theoretical computer science, so it's a little bit confusing. And also a son called Greg Valiant. Um, okay, anyway, uh, right, so um, this theorem, I'll, I'll tell you about it in a second. What I really like about it, it's like, a, it's like a very classic, it's about complexity classes, it's about space and time, like it's a cool result, so I think it really deserves some attention. And um, we'll see some, it's going to pop up again a couple of times uh, in later lectures, so it'll be cool to, to know it. Okay, so what is the theorem? I can't remember if I mentioned it before, but uh, let T of n be a time function that's um, nice. So it should probably be time constructible and maybe like a little bit additionally constructible. Honestly, I didn't think it through it too carefully, but like if you look at this footnote from homework two, or homework one about the block respecting business, some constructability might be involved there, but just let it be a nice function. And the theorem is that uh, anytime you can solve in time t, you can also solve in space less than t, notably less than t, t of n over log t of n. Okay, so if you want, you can specialize this to t of n just being n and get that time n, so linear time, is contained in space n over log n. And this, of course, is on uh, multi-tape Turing machines. I'll come back to that in a second. But that's pretty cool, right? I mean, we know kind of trivially that any problem that you can solve in a linear amount of time, you can solve with a linear amount of space because your linear time Turing machine only has time to access a linear amount of space, so that's trivial. But this says you can save a non-trivial amount of space. You can save a log n factor. So like you'll never need uh, the full amount of, of linear space, which is pretty cool. Um, in fact, you know, for the rest of the lecture when I'm talking about this, I'm going to prove this for this you know, general time-bound T of n, but really it was a choice. I could have just done it for this specific case, honestly, because once you have this, you can get it for sort of like larger uh, functions by padding, the same as in like homework one, problem three, A. Like basically once you know this, you know, you can artificially pad your input lengths from n to n squared and you'll get that like time n squared is contained in space n squared over log n. Okay, so I, may, I could have just done it for uh, linear uh, bound T of n, but I'll just do it with capital T. And another reason why this is kind of cool is that uh, this class here, space T of n over log T of n, is uh, contained, but strictly contained, in space T of n. Okay, again, maybe assuming T of n is space constructible or something, because T of n is like noticeably bigger than uh, log T of n. So, you know, it's the cor 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 corollary, it's a space hierarchy theorem, that uh, time t of n is strictly contained in space t of n. So it's like space is strictly more valuable than time, which is pretty cool. So, I mean, uh, that's, you know, why I like this theorem. It really tells us something about complexity theory. Um, right, so time, yeah, linear time is a strict subset of linear space. So before I get into this theorem, I want to make some remarks about it. Um, the first remark, which is a good remark, is that it turns out that this theorem is very uh, model independent. Okay, so what I mean by that is we'll prove it in the context of multi-tape Turing machines, but you know, when you're doing complexity, you always maybe have to think about what your model is, and it makes slight differences, and there are like log factors in here, which are the things that can, you know, get changed when you switch between models. But it turns out that like, uh, this also holds for uh, random access Turing machines, and it also holds for pointer machines, which is some other model that people have studied. I don't know about one-tape Turing machines, but we don't like to study them. So basically all the interesting models, 
the same theorem holds. Uh, it's not immediate, like it took papers in each of the cases, but it, it, it's known to hold. Um, which is good because uh, what that means is like this is really telling you something actually true about computation, that like space is more valuable than time. It's not telling you something about like, a quirk of the multi-tape Turing machine model. It's like actually telling you something fundamental about the nature of computation, which is good. Um, Another remark uh, is that back in 1977, like this was a cool result and it set off a chain of people working on related results and uh, using the ideas to prove more things. So back then, if you took the ideas in this paper and added some more ingredients like um, alternation, like polynomial time hierarchy, which is something we'll talk about uh, later, and uh, use the, the very sharp non-deterministic time hierarchy theorem that I talked about last time, and some other stuff. Uh, it led to several results. The most dramatic one uh, was proved by Paul, Pippinger, Samaretti, and Trotter in 83. And they showed this result. Uh, time n is strictly contained in something n, and that something is not space, but it's non-deterministic time. So again, it's trivial that linear time is a subset of non-deterministic linear time, and they showed this is a strict separation. Non-deterministic linear time is strictly more powerful than uh, deterministic time. And that's really, well, people thought that was really cool, and it is really cool. Um, although, let me make some remarks about that. First of all, you might get all, like, all excited, because it's really, it's like P does not equal NP for linear time rather than polynomial time, which is pretty awesome. Um, but one slight downside is uh, this is like the this is like the non-inequality. It's saying this is not equal to this. So like you cannot like artificially inflate these ends functions upward and get non-equality. Because if you think about how padding works, it's problem three on the homework, right? If you have two classes that are equal, then that can like translate upwards. Like you get the same result for like higher running times. Uh, therefore, by contrapositive, like disequalities like go downwards. So like, if you knew that time n squared was different from non-deterministic time n squared, you could conclude that time n is different from non-deterministic time n, but it's not the other way around. So in fact, uh, they, this is the best they could get. Um, in 2001, Santhanam actually improved this result to uh, n square root of log star n, appearing here and here. But like getting this up to n times log n would be uh, a miracle. So. Um, that's pretty good. Also, in, uh, in NP versus P, it's a bit, okay, do you have a question? Okay. Okay. So in NP versus uh, P, it's even stronger, right? Because P is not just like linear time or N squared time. It's the union over all polynomial time. So like if you want to show that NP equals, is different from P, you have to show that like there's some language that can be solved in non-deterministic time, let's say N to the 10th which not only cannot be solved in deterministic time n to the 10th, it cannot even be solved in deterministic time n to the anything. So like, you're allowing the, the deterministic algorithm more resources than the non-deterministic algorithm and potentially trying to show np does not equal np. And here they get the exact same amount of resources, linear time. So it's still pretty cool, yeah. So over there when you said that it implies the space hierarchy theorem, that's like... Oh no, no, sorry, this is implied by the space hierarchy theorem. This fact that this is a strict subset of this is a consequence of the space hierarchy theorem. I'm just reminding you that this is the reason why this is a strict subset of this. Yeah. Um, right. Uh, the last thing I want to say about this PPST result, again, that it's uh, cool, uh, but it seemingly um, uh, depends on the multi-tape Turing machine model. Uh, in the sense that we don't know how to prove it for other models like pointer machines or random access Turing machines. We don't know how to prove this theorem. So it could be that this fact, or at least the proof of this fact, is like really exploiting, in some ways, the quirks of the multi-tape Turing machine model um, in a way that this one isn't, because we know how to prove it for several other models. So like This one we are more confident is like really a, a true fact about computation. This is true. And of course, we believe it on other models, but like maybe the proof is somehow specific to the model. Okay. Any questions? So the rest of the, the I mean, I'm not going to start to write proof sketch for this theorem. Yeah? Does 
not generalized beyond linear whatsoever. <laughs> well, you can get n square root log star n. Yeah, it's compared to linear. It's oh, it's uh, no. It's this is this function is appearing in both places, oh, okay. Okay. and that strictly implies this by like padding like downward. Yeah. Actually, I think if you look carefully at PPST, they get this. They get this with fourth root of log star n. For a reason we'll actually see in a later, well, the idea is we'll see in a later um, theorem. I can just say right now, like building on some of these ideas in like a somewhat later class, we're going to prove results by a, a bunch of people uh, from the 2000s that show things like if you want to solve SAT uh, with a logarithmic space Turing machine, you need time n to the 1.8. We think you need like exponential time, but you know it's better than a, a linear lower bound on time, assuming small space. So this theorem has some of the same ideas as that one. Okay, so yeah, proof sketch. Um, I write sketch because even though we have I don't know 70 minutes left or something, I cannot like do every last uh, detail. So I hope at the end of this you'll say like yeah, I got the high level ideas and most of the ideas, and maybe there's some details that would need to be filled in, but uh, I think you'll get it. So what is the plan? I mean, I'm proving here uh, this theorem right here. So obviously, I'll assume I have uh, a time t of n Turing machine. The uh, time O of t deterministic Turing machine. And you know, what do I need to do? I need to simulate it. by a low space machine. Uh, space order t over log t machine. Okay, I don't even going to worry about introducing the language or anything that it decides. I'll just say I'm going to get a low space machine that exactly simulates this uh, machine which runs in t of n time. Um, Okay, so that's what I'll be talking about for the rest of the lecture, how to build this simulator, this low space simulator that's simulating this uh, time t machine m. And actually for simplicity uh, in today's sketch, I'm not going to prove uh, quite this. I'll prove something slightly weaker. I'm going to prove this uh, times log log t. Okay, so instead of t over log t, I'll lose a log log t factor, which is very small compared to the savings that we're getting. And uh, qualitatively, it's you know the same thing. I mean, for example, I could still deduce this qualitatively that uh, space is strictly better than time. Okay, so I hope you're not too sad that I'll lose this log log factor. Okay. So, uh, what's the first thing I'm going to do in the simulation of M? Well, I'm going to clean up M a little bit. Uh, a la homework one problem two. So the first step is to um, let b of n be t of n to the two thirds uh, and assume that m is a b of n block respecting. I'll remind you what that means. Hopefully you don't need a reminder. Uh, but maybe you were so keen as to turn in the homework on Saturday and therefore you've now forgotten. Uh, this is from homework uh, one, problem two. Uh, so what does that mean? It means like if M is this machine, it has, well, multiple tapes. So let me just draw one tape for a second. Uh, it means you can divide its tapes into blocks of length B. So t to the two thirds. And then the machine has the property that um, the head sort of always stays inside a block for each block of b time. So like it only goes between blocks, uh, time steps which are multiples of t to the two thirds. Okay, so let me draw an example where it has three tapes, just because that's a relatively small number. Okay, so each, all the three tapes can be divided into blocks. And uh, you only rarely cross the blocks, you know, on multiples of B time. Uh, let me mention also that this two-thirds is not extremely important. Um, 
It's enough that it's like somehow polynomially related to t. And maybe depending on how you do the proof, it should be bigger than root t. So I just two thirds of the number between a half and one. Um, but don't get too stressed out about that. Uh, so let me just uh, continue uh, reminding a little bit about block respecting this. Um, what it further means is that like you can divide time into you know blocks of uh, t to the two thirds, and I'll call those um, epochs. So let me introduce some more notation. V will be order t, I'm being a bit sloppy here, but by this I mean the running time of capital M divided by B, okay, which is uh, order t to the one third. And this will be the number of like time epochs that M runs for. Okay, so I'm going to divide time into these uh, this many epochs, like which is a bunch of time, and the point is that like within one epoch, like uh, the tape heads always stay inside blocks. Okay, so in like the first epoch between I don't know time one and time b, like all three tape heads will be somewhere in here. Okay, and then at epoch two, there's potential that like the tape heads will move to different blocks. It doesn't have to happen. So like maybe at epoch two, like this tape head goes into this block, and this tape head goes into this block, and this tape head stays inside this block, and then epoch two, they're working on these three blocks, and maybe in epoch three, this tape head goes into this block, and these two stay or something. Okay, so within each epoch, of which they're v, which is t to the one-third, the heads stay inside blocks. Okay, so I guess you'll have to kind of remember these parameters. B is the size of a block is t to the two-thirds, and they're t to the one-third epochs or epochs. Um, okay, any questions so far? Yeah. As far as modeling comes, um, at least the way I did it, the block respecting Turing machine depends pretty heavily on the fact that the tape heads can only move one slot to the right or left. Like, you said random access Turing machines, this works too? Yeah. Does the, does the block respecting thing do, you do the same trick here? Uh, I didn't read the paper, but I do know that there is a paper, so like, it's not like you, once you prove this for multi-tape Turing machines, it's like obvious it holds in other models. Like, there was like a full paper in, you know, from 1982 or something that like showed the same theorem for random access Turing machines. And like there's another full paper that like did it for pointer machines. And I didn't actually look at those, so I don't know what ideas they used exactly, but it's obvious that like you're gonna need some somewhat different uh, yeah, ideas. Uh, good. Um, yeah, let me just ask, uh, say that this is um, like without loss of generality, so like as we saw, I should have said this more carefully. First, we assume that M is any old time order T machine um, that decides some language. But as you saw in the homework, there's another Turing machine, which we're going to also call M, which decides the same language. It has only a constant factor slow down in its running time, so it's still order T time, and it is block respecting. And I guess, I, mean, who, I don't know who asked Corwin, like, it's not uh, exactly block respecting in the sense that maybe the very first thing it does is like sets up on its tape like you know b um, bits, and then it becomes block respecting. Um, but that amount of like setting up the b bits takes only b space because uh, we only count the work tape space. So like the low space simulator we're doing can like simulate that part in like t to the two-thirds space, which is much less than it's shooting for. So like that little bit that's not block respecting at the start is also okay. Um, that was a technicality. I might not get into such technicalities as time goes on, but. Okay, any more questions? Okay, so, uh, okay, so now I want to define some stuff. So vis-a-vis uh, -vis capital M's computation, uh, I'm gonna define some info about it. So. Or epochs, uh, you know, little t equals one, two, three, up to the last one, which I'm calling little v. Uh, define two things. Um, one is some, these are like two sets of info. Uh, state of t, which I'll define to be the, the Turing machine state, m state, like, you know, q7 or whatever, and the head locations 
on the k tapes, you know, in this picture there was three, let me call it k in general, the k tapes, at the end of the epoch. Okay. So this, um, sort of ignoring the actual contents of the tape, this tells you like basically what the situation is at the end of each epoch. So like a state one tells you like the three head positions, which, you know, I suppose it's often the case that the head position is really close to the block boundary because like that's the only chance it has to cross the block boundary. But you know, the three tape positions and you know, what state the Turing machine was in. Um, and let me just say that uh, what I'm actually going to like focus on a lot is not so much the head locations as just which blocks were being worked on. But that's a function of the head locations, right? Like if I tell you the head locations at the end of the epoch, you know which block it was working on during, on each of the tapes during that epoch because it's block respecting. So this quantity like implies, you know, which blocks, I should say, you know, which k blocks, if they're k tapes, worked on during that epoch. Okay, and the other thing I wanted to define is something called uh, contents t, which is just the tape contents of those, where I mean this, blocks, again at the end of, ep at the, end of the epoch. Okay, but I want to separate these two things out a little bit. Um, okay, so at the end of epoch uh, one, state is telling you what the, the Turing machine state is and where the heads are. And uh, contents one would be telling you, we know in epic one it's working on these three blocks. So contents would be telling you literally like the t to the two thirds characters on each of these k tapes. Okay. And one thing to think about, and we're going to think about this more carefully, but that, that's all the information you need to know if you're like a simulator, the low space simulator, and you're ready to do epic two. Because, well, you need to know the state, certainly. You need to know the head location, certainly. And you kind of at least may need to know the contents of the first three blocks if the heads are planning to stay in those blocks. If the heads are planning to like go to the second block, one of them, then you don't really need to know the contents, or you need to know that it's blank because you can, uh, yeah. Why we don't need to know the, the content of the next portion of the tape? Well, it's either blank or it's from the uh, read-only input tape. So you might need to know that like you should look at the input tape to get I mean, after, potentially this one. After t equals one, yes, but like in general, like it could be written at the previous stage something that way. Right? That's what we're gonna get into now. Yeah. That was very specific to like t equals one. Yeah. Yeah. Good. So that's exactly what I'd like to get into now. Uh, we're gonna define something called the uh, computation graph of M, really on X, I suppose, but uh, on the input. And I'll call this graph uh, G. Okay, and it's going to have, uh, I'll, let me tell you, its vertices and its edges. So its, its vertices V will just be uh, the epochs. Okay, so um, there's going to be little v many vertices. There's going to be basically t to the one third of them, and they're going to represent the epochs. So let me draw a picture here. One, two, three. I'm drawing them in a line for a reason you'll see in a second. So those represent the epochs. And what are the edges? There's going to be two kinds of edges, but they'll be. Similar. So first of all, um, for all little t, add in the edge uh, t minus 1 to t. Okay, and you don't yet see where this is going, but uh, for some future intuition, this just represents the fact in some sense that in order to simulate, let's say, the third epoch, you kind of need to at least somewhat know what's going on in the second epoch because like 
you definitely need to know to get started on the third epic, like the Turing machine state and the head locations in the previous epic. That's for sure. Um, but now, getting back a little bit to Alex's question, we'll uh, put in some more edges that have to do with the tape contents. Okay, so what else intuitively, this kind of represents like the, what you need to know to simulate the epic. So like, let's say you're about to simulate epic three. You're the low space simulator, the T over log T simulator. Um, you know, you might be able to see that like, okay, in epic three, maybe uh, I'm gonna be working on this tape, this block, this block, and this block. So you kind of need to know like, what is the contents of those blocks? And uh, the content of this block comes from like, well, you kind of just need to know what was going on the last time M worked on this block. Okay, so I'll write this somewhat in a poor way, but for all T, you want to look at for all K blocks touched at time T, or you know, worked on in epic T, you want to know like for the most recent, you know, S less than T. Uh, that touched B uh, well if for all the situation like add in the edge from S to T this is a I wrote this poorly but does it kind of make sense um, so you'll be adding some edges that go like this okay and um, you know, you put in an edge if uh, like this edge is saying that like, well, in the computation of M at epic three, one of the tape heads is working on some block. And the last time the machine worked on that block was a time step, uh, time epic one. Okay. Any questions? Yeah. So this is like the last used timestamp of that block. And I think, actually, I didn't think this totally through, but I think to be careful, like, you should somehow, if it was never previously used, and, like, maybe you should, like, have, like, you know, a block that was never previously used, like, maybe you should put this in here, and, like, that is maybe signals that you should get that block contents from the input tape, if necessary, but, like, I just chose to ignore that point. Um, I'm sure it's fine. <laughs> yeah, you can add a zero state, yeah. Okay, um, yeah, that would be fine. Okay, so uh, let's just observe a couple of tiny things. This is G, uh, example G. G is a DAG, a directed acyclic graph, it's clear, and uh, has V vertices. And the other thing that's important is it has um, a bounded max integree, uh, K, uh, plus one. Okay, because for every uh, epoch, like, they're only k blocks, k is the number of tapes that are being worked on, so you only have to look back for k different blocks where the last time you touched it was. And the plus one is because I always put in these like uh, distance one edges. Okay, so it's quite important that, and k is considered to be like a fixed constant, so it's quite important that this is a graph with a constant maximum in degree. In particular, it means it has big O of number of vertices edges. It's a sparse graph. Yep? Um, I don't see immediately why it has bounded out degree. Uh, oh, um, yeah, I think it's okay, yeah, you're right, yeah, okay, good. Um, somehow I was totally focused on in degree though, so I never thought about that. Okay, so now let's get into the idea of the proof, the low space simulation, which hopefully is a little, tiny bit started to be suggested to you by what I've been saying. So. Um, Let's imagine we're the simulator now, and we're trying to u really use low space. So what do we need to do in order to simulate? I'm going to add the I word idea here. Uh, to simulate the teeth epoch, OK, we only need to know some things. Well, um, you probably need to know like state of t minus 1. All right, that's you need to know what Turing machine state you should be in and like where the heads are, presumably. But since we're thinking about low space simulations, just bear in mind that this is very little information. This is order 
uh, log capital T bits. Right, because it's just a Turing machine state, that's constantly many bits. There's a constant number of head locations, uh, head, yeah, head locations, and each head location is between one and capital T, so you can write it with log T bits. Um, so you certainly need to know that, but you know, the, the main point of this, uh, this story is that you need to know not too much. You need to know contents S uh, for all predecessors S of T. Okay, because like, um, you know, those are, you know the K, little k blocks that you're going to be working on. Um, and you're going to stay inside those blocks during this epoch T, because it's block respecting. So it's actually just enough for you to carry out this part of the simulation to know these, uh, you know, their contents coming in, uh, you know, at the beginning of the epoch. Okay, and this is, well, there's only K of these predecessors at most. And so this is order B bits, which is T to the two thirds bits. So um, potentially locally at the start of each epoch, like in order to get started, like you don't need that much information, T to the two thirds information. But of course, we have to keep track of like, you know, like when you finish simulating this epoch, you like know what is the contents of all the blocks you just finished working on, and you might want to save that information because you may need it later. But what we're going to see is like maybe there's a chance you don't have to save every block of information you ever create. Maybe you can like smartly erase a little bit of it, but still manage to pull through the whole simulation. Okay, so. As I said, like the naive thing is you could, as the low space simulator, just um, sequentially compute by simulation, um, you know, for t1 up to v, just everything, uh, all this stuff. But you know, the main work is computing these things, and like you compute this information and you do it for v time epochs. That would be, you know, v times order b space, which is order t to the one third times t to the two thirds, which is order t space. So, like, you didn't save anything. I mean, this is just to say that if you just literally do the simulation in the natural way, you don't save anything. But as I said, you know, uh, there's a chance that. You don't have to remember all this information. Like once you can comp compute it, like once you compute the contents, let's see, contents of T, you definitely need to know these predecessor contents. But maybe you'll never need those contents again, depending on what the graph looks like. So maybe you could just erase them and reuse that space. Okay, this leads us to idea two, which I just said in words, but I guess I'll write it. You could perhaps you know, this is a key question. Selectively delete, smartly delete um, some contents and reuse space, or only recompute them if needed. So that's another possibility. Maybe you'll like temporarily delete some of them to like save some space, and then like maybe much later you'd be like, oh, I really needed that. Well, maybe you could just recompute it. Um, so you might not necessarily do everything totally in order. Okay, so uh, what's going to happen is that, um, let me erase this. What's going to happen is that idea two uh, will in fact come to fruition. Um, it's going to turn out that like, Idea two can be done in such a way that you only ever need uh, to keep not all little v, but like v over log v many contents around at any one time. Okay, so you might like recompute and erase and stuff, but you'll have like, you'll actually never be storing more than this many 
different contents. And still you'll manage to kind of like get your way to the end of the simulation. OK, and that's good because this right here is the savings. Storing v would be trivial because basically you just store everything that you ever compute. So because of this, you know, um, your total space will be this. And then the contents are order b. Right, this is t to the 2 thirds. This is t to the 1 third over log t. OK, and so the total space is these multiplied to get t, but this is your savings, t over log t. And one thing you see, it's not super crucial what t is, as long as t is like some power of, sorry, it's not super crucial what b was, or equivalently what v is, as long as it's some power of capital T, it's OK. Uh, there'll be some trick later where I'll do a move that like you think it could probably be done in order v space, but like uh, just to be on the safe side, we'll do it in order v squared space. But then we'll be like, hey, v squared is still just t to the two thirds, which is much less than our overall bound. How we, how we get the graph in the first place? Can we just guess it? Uh, I'll come to that and yes. In fact, maybe that's what I'm coming to next, but yes. <laughs> That's another funny thing. You should remember what we're designing here is like a low space algorithm. We don't care about its time. And psychologically, it's always a little weird to design low space algorithms because you can do all sorts of ridiculous things that you wouldn't normally think to do because you don't care about the running time. You only care about space. You can do ridiculous things like try out all of exponentially many possibilities and see which one works. Um, OK. Actually, I meant to say that fact even earlier. Um, so let me say another thing. Uh, when I get to this, I'll, I'll like lose a log log here. So that's where the log log is going to come from. So you can do it with v over log v, whatever that means, but um, I'll lose a little bit. And let me just uh, address that other question. Which is that you know this low space simulator is going to like very cleverly decide like which contents to save and which ones to erase and when and where. Obviously, it seems like in order to do that, you kind of need to know what the graph is if you're going to like make this clever plan. Um, but in fact, you can assume, as was pointed out, without loss of generality, that uh, the simulator knows the graph and why is that? Well. Um, you try all the G's, reusing space. So basically the very first thing the, you know, the algorithm does is it's like, let's write down the first possible G, try our simulation and see if it works or not. And if it doesn't, let's go into the second possible G. See now, like, what is the space to write down a G? Well, it's like, I don't know, O twiddle of V, right? Because there's this many vertices, and you've got to say for each one the constant number of predecessors it has. Maybe it's like log V bits to write down the name of a vertex. But this is like O twiddle T to the one third, which is much less than the overall space we're shooting for. So we can just have like a try all graphs tape that we like constantly cycle around through. Yep. Right, so uh, it's not quite finished. You do need to kind of tell a correct G from the wrong G. But basically, and I guess I won't write anything, but you have to think about it a little bit. Like you just start the simulation as if you had correctly guessed the right G. And then uh, you basically just have to check as you're going th along through the simulation that G uh, is really what you've guessed it to be. And basically it's something that you can notice, right? So like, um, I think maybe you have to keep a little bit of information around, like maybe for every block, as you're doing your simulation, you should like write the timestamp of like when you last touched it. And then when you come to a new epoch, uh, you should check that that arrow is really proper, like that it really was the case that the, this arrow which you guessed really is, you know, does have its tail at the, the last time you touched it, which you could know by like having the timestamps for each of the blocks, which is again like, log t bits of information per v. So I think you can, basically you can check in your simulation going, as your simulation is going along that you've got the correct g. And if you don't, you just abandon the situation and restart the whole business with the next g. OK, so uh, it's a little funky, but uh, that's the situation. 
So, good. So, in some sense, we now enter the truly interesting part of the proof. Um, so we assume, we can now assume that the, the low space simulation algorithm knows this graph. And basically it's in this position where like it kind of has to, it kind of needs to figure out the state and contents for the last section, the last epoch. And like for each vertex, like the incoming arrows tells it like what it needs to like know to not have erased in order to be able to get that uh, vertexes, contents, and everything. So it's like some kind of game on this graph that it has to like play very successfully. And uh, this game is called the pebbling game. And uh, it was kind of introduced in this paper, although people later discovered it appeared in some totally unrelated paper, like early 70s, about like register allocation. But it's subsequently shown up in several places in complexity. So it's it's nice to know a little bit about this concept called pebbling. So now, in some sense, I'm going to like take a little break from talking about this low space simulator and the HPV theorem and tell you about some unrelated fun uh, graph thing called pebbling. But I hope you'll see that it's extremely related to this idea too. So pebbling is a game. Uh, it's a solo game. It's a one player game played on a DAG. Uh, Okay, and so let me draw an example DAG. Uh, this, this, three, four, let me see. I'm going to get it slightly similar to the one I have in my notes. Okay, uh, so the DAG will of course be the computation graph, but let me just for fun draw something which is not actually a computation graph, just to emphasize that you can play this pebbling game on any DAG. Um, I don't know, so it's got some, it's a DAG, so all the edges go forward in this ordering, and um, maybe like this, and like this, and uh, maybe like this. Okay, that's a plausible looking DAG, okay? Uh, on a DAG, okay, that has some sources. A source means just a, a, a node with no in edges. And let's say one sink. A sink is something that has no out edges, but let's say it's uh, something that you, a sink is something that you kind of care about. Um, so. This is a source, this is a source, uh, this is a sink. And uh, what are the rules of the game? Basically, uh, you have like a bunch of pebbles in your hand or your pocket, and uh, your, your ultimate goal is to get a pebble onto the sink. But there are some rules about how you can manipulate the pebbles. So uh, rule one is you can always put a pebble on a vertex if um, all its predecessors have pebbles. Here I kind of, for uh, concision, I like put two rules into one. Usually people state this in a more relaxed way. They say, you can always put a pebble on a source. Well, it's technically included in this. A source is something that has no predecessors. Uh, so you can always put a pebble on a source, and like you can put a pebble on a vertex so long as like all its immediate predecessors are pebbled. So if you want to put a pebble here, you have to have a pebble here, here, and here. If you want to put a pebble here, you have to have a pebble here. You can always put a pebble here if you want. I'm not sure you're trying to conserve pebbles. And uh, this rule is analogous to like, you know, you can only simulate a, a given epoch if like you know what happened in all the epochs with incoming arrows. And the other you know, pebbling game rule is you can always remove a pebble if you want. Any pebble that's down there, you can remove it. Okay, and that's corresponds to like, hey, you can delete some stuff you've already computed if you want. And of course the goal is to get the pebble on the sink. Which again, back to our, you know, uh, computation, our theorem, it's like you've got to figure out the, the contents and state for the last vertex. Um, and you want to use as few pebbles as possible. And just to emphasize what I mean by this, uh, it's like how many physical pebbles you would need to hold in order to make it happen. Or another way to put it is the maximum number of pebbles that you ever have placed is what you're trying to minimize. Okay, because that's exactly corresponds to the maximum 
you know, number of contents that you're like saving on your tape, which is what you're trying to conserve, tape space. So, uh, do you kind of see how like playing this uh, pebbling game like effectively with a small number of pebbles is exactly like implementing idea two? I hope you kind of see that. And what we're going to show later is that for every V vertex uh, graph with constant in degree, you can succeed in pebbling it with only V over log V pebbles. I'll write that, but that's the statement. So just so everybody's on the same page, um, let's pebble this graph. <laughs> Would somebody like to do it? I'll start. The pebbles will be green, so I'm going to put a pebble here. Who wants to come and finish it? <laughs> come on. <laughs> Yeah, come on up. I think you can do it with four, and I think you can't do it with three, so you should all mentally check that. So you can draw the pebbles and erase the pebbles. And our role is to check, what's your name again? Sorry? Kevin. Kevin, yeah, to check that he doesn't cheat. <laughs> okay, that's allowed because he's got the, the predecessor pebbled. Yeah, that's allowed because he's got them pebbled. He's used three so far. Okay, now he's, he's erasing some, that's good. Oh, can't, can't do that one yet. <laughs> okay, he's used four, which I think is the minimum you can use. Oh, good, it's crucial that he erase those because like he's, up, he's used three. Yeah, now he's, done, he's got four, but he legally got that guy. And you got the last one. Awesome. Yeah, congratulations, Kevin. Yeah, thank you. Great. So we got the rules? Yeah, awesome. OK. That's great. Is it like super obvious that you can't do three? I could? Because to put a bubble in the previous one, not the last one, but the previous one, you need three other bubbles. Yeah, I guess this guy is in degree three. So in order to place, assuming you eventually need to pebble this guy, which I guess you do, because you need to pebble this guy to pebble this guy. Like when you place that pebble, you have to already have had three down, and then you're placing a fourth one down. Okay, good. But we will recompute like a bunch of stuff. What's that? We will recompute a bunch of stuff again and again. It's okay. Remember, yeah, we're, yeah. that's the weird thing. Like we're not trying to save on time. We're only trying to save on space. And in fact, um, for the most effective pebbling strategies that we're going to see, you will actually use an exponential amount of time. The strategy will take an exponential and v amount of time. But it'll be low space. Um, good. So the theorem that we need to prove uh, was proved originally by um, Hopcraft, Paul, and Valiant. And it's what I said, that um, V vertices, constant in degree, you can do it with V over log V pebbles. OK, so theorem, HPV, um, V vertices. And order one in degree, you can always do it with order v over log v pebbles. Um, they don't really care, but I think if the in degree is c, then this constant is just like c squared. So it's, it's fine. It's nothing especially big. Anyway, that's basically the number of tapes for us, which is a constant, so it's not important. And now I'll prove this. This is a purely like kind of combinatorics, graph theory thing. Um, first of all, I will not write down a whole proof. So even this will just be a sketch. And I'll also only do it for order uh, v log over log v times log log v. OK. Uh, so the proof that you can do with v log v is pretty tricky. There's a simplified version of it, which is still a little bit tricky. Um, it actually also, I think, has some like non-constructive aspect to it. You just show that the strategy exists. And um, to prove that this is best, it is best, it's very hard. Uh, when they first proved this upper bound, they really didn't have any lower bound, but uh, they kind of asked Cook, Steve Cook, uh, around the time, and he showed a root v lower bound, which is not so easy. And then later, some people got the v over log v lower bound, but it's quite complicated. Need some super concentrator graphs. Uh, but this upper bound that I'll show you is not hard. And as I said, it, it can actually take exponentially many v steps, which is corresponds to the time, but we're not worried about time. OK. OK, 
Can anybody guess the key tool we will use for this proof? Yes? Uh, like dividing um, kind of. It'll be, uh, yeah, actually the, the, their proof uses divide and conquer. Uh, the key tool I was thought you might guess is homework one, problem one. <laughs> <laughs> which is this depth reduction lemma, which I'll assume you have at the tip of your tongue. So we have a graph here, a DAG, and um, what is the point of this depth reduction lemma? It tells you you can like delete a small number of edges and get into a situation where the graph has no long paths. Just somehow kind of good. The idea is we're going to like try to get pebbles onto those deleted edges, which is maybe not too many, leave them there forever, and then there'll be somehow like the remainder of the graph in some sense will only have short paths, and that'll be kind of helpful because Having really long paths in the graph is kind of bad for pebbling in some way. We'll, we'll see it more later, but like, let's just blindly apply the homework uh, uh, results. So we have this graph. Uh, it has some number of edges, which we called m in the problem. Well, let's order v, because constant in degree and v vertices. And uh, the problem also, we need to know something about the max depth to start, which was called d. We don't know anything, so we can just say, well, it's, it's at most v. I mean, it's order v. I don't know. It's at most v. Let's take the naive upper bound. Uh, okay. And then um, in that problem, you defined uh, k as some parameter, which is like the log of uh, d. Okay, which is like log uh, v. And then finally, you have this like user selected parameter r, which controlled like this trade-off between how much depth you wanted to like it down to and how many edges you had to delete. Yeah? Yeah, so uh, I'm just going back to the depth, uh, sorry, the edges count thing. Do you yeah. ever use the fact that the integrate is constant other than to say that we have a linear number of edges in the graph? Yeah, we're going to use it again later. But that's a reasonable question. Okay, so this user-selected parameter R, it's actually exactly, we need to exactly tune it so the, the resulting depth and the number of edges deleted will be the same. Okay, um, so the simplest way to do that is to like let r be uh, like log of k, which is like log log v. And therefore, what the, the lemma tells us is that by deleting, okay, it was, if you recall, r over k times m uh, edges. And let's figure out what that is. Well, m is v, k is log v, and r is log log v. So that's your order v over log v times log log v edges. Uh, you can reduce depth to, to uh, d, what is it? d over 2r, 2 to the r. OK, 2 to the r is uh, k which is like log d, which is like log v. So this is like order v over log v. OK, I actually didn't get them exactly the same. This one's a little bit less. But like if I fudged the constants, I could have made them both equal to this, which is actually worse. But I can't get them both equal to like v over log v with this lemma. I can, the best I can get is to get both these quantities at most v over log v times log log v. But we'll just take that and not worry about the log log v. OK, so hopefully you remember the, the homework problem. But if you don't, by some like graph theory, uh, we have this. Okay. Any any questions? Uh, okay. And let me just uh, change one slight thing here. Let me just change this word edges to vertices, so it'll make more sense in the context of the proof. That's equally fine, right? For every edge, I'll just imagine deleting both its endpoints. So I lose a factor of two here, but whatever. I already have a big O. Um, so I'm going to think of it as like, in a graph like this, I can delete, and delete, I'm not really going to think of deleting it either, but like, let me say, uh, like, say for now, I can maybe mark a couple, some small number of edges, v over log v times log log v, uh, and that'll be good for me in the sense that like now, uh, the resulting graph with these guys deleted has low depth. In other words, any path in this graph that avoids the deleted vertices, it's not too long. It's at most v over log v. 
I just realized it's like a bit intense for like lecture three. Like we're doing like a one eighty minute theorem, but well, it's great. That's life. Uh, okay, so uh, I apply this theorem, and like let me let p be those vertices that could be deleted, and p stands for permanent pebble positions. Okay, but you'll see that in a second. Okay. So my goal in this pebbling strategy will really to be like get uh, pebbles onto the set P and then like never remove those pebbles ever. Uh, and that'll help me pebble everything. So actually let me use this picture. These were the ones that I supposedly deleted. What, I won't actually delete them, but I'll just say these are the, the guys that are P. So P will be... Uh, these positions, I guess I'm, for some reason I'm drawing them as if they have a pebble in them already, but um, so let, this will just mark P. And let me also add the sink into P. Even though P probably is, doesn't include the sink, let me just put it into the sink, uh, put the sink into P. It does, certainly doesn't change the fact that P's cardinality is at most this, just plus one. And it'll just be technically convenient um, because now what I'll say in my pebbling strategy is I'm just going to attempt to get pebbles on everything in P. And if I can do that, then in particular I've got a pebble on the sink. Okay, still, still with me? Okay, we're getting towards done. Um, okay. So now I will tell you the algorithm for uh, pebbling it. The pebbling strategy was succeeds, and I won't prove it, but I'll say it's an exercise, and um, it's kind of clear. Uh, let me just, okay, let me, vis-a-vis -vis P, let me put out the key point here that like, what is the point of P? It's that any path in the graph avoiding P has length at most capital L, which is order V over log V. Okay, that's the point of capital P. Okay, so what is the pebbling strategy? Mm, so first, I mean, imagine you topologically sort uh, P. I mean, just for notation, like, right, P is, uh, you know, U1, U2, U3 up to U cardinality of P. I guess this one is the sink. Okay, so just that this is like left to right order. And then my overall strategy looks like this. For I equals one up to cardinality of P, do a strategy called uh, depth first pebble uh, UI. Okay, so I'm going to try using some kind of depth first search like algorithm to get a pebble here. Then I'm going to try to get one here. Then I'm going to try to get it here and so forth. And one thing I'm going to do is like, you know, these pebbling strategies are going to involve placing pebbles and removing pedal, pebbles and things. But like, as I said before, like, I'm never ever going to remove any pebble that's in P. So like once I get a pebble on P, like I will never get rid of it. That's okay. P does not have too many pebbles, right? P has a number of pebbles, which is big O of what we're shooting for. So that's, that's fine. Um, to always leave those pebbles there. Uh, let me just actually add like a, a parameter to this function that I'm defining, depth first pebble, which I'll call don't delete. Uh, and this don't delete parameter, when I call it over initially, I'll set it to P. So the step first pebble will take the, peb the, the vertex you're trying to get a pebble onto and also some set of vertices that like this routine should like never delete. Okay, and we'll set that to be P in the global algorithm. Okay, so the step first pebbling algorithm just works exactly as you expect it to. So hopefully you would write down this. Um, so how do I write the step first pebble algorithm? Again, it takes two inputs, a vertex U that's trying to pebble, and a set of vertices, I'm breaking mathematical norms here by like writing uh, like a 10 character uh, name for a set, but that stands for a set, don't delete. Uh, it's, Vertices you should not remove a pebble from. Pebble from. 
Okay, so how does this step first pebbling algorithm work? By recursion in the obvious way. So for each w in the predecessors of u, and by the way, that's at most the maximum integree, which is k plus 1. Anyway, it's a constant, okay, a fixed constant. Let me call it c. I know in the, in the context of our actual proof, it's k plus 1, but just in a general graph, maybe it's c, but think of it as a constant. So first, check if w is already pebbled. If it's, it's already pebbled, you don't need to do anything. I mean, that won't be the case at the very beginning. Let me see if w not already pebbled. But as you're going along, you might have placed some pebbles. And uh, if you already got a pebble there, then you're happy. Might be part of the permanent pebbles, might be part of a recursive call. Um, but anyways, if, uh, if you haven't, do depth first pebble on this w. And you're not supposed to delete, don't delete, so keep that around. And you know, also don't delete any of the predecessors of u, because like that's the whole point. You're trying to get pebbles onto the predecessors of u. So if you do that, don't remove anything. Okay, and so um, by recursion or induction or whatever, like once this finishes, uh, you'll have pebbles on all the predecessors of u. So now you're eligible by the rules of the game to put a pebble on u. So like put pebble on u. And then um, you might as well clean up. So like remove all the pebbles that you might have placed. So just remove all pebbles. Well, except don't remove don't delete, because that's the thing you're told, don't delete. And don't also remove u, because that was the whole point of this endeavor, to get a pebble onto u. So that defines the pebbling strategy. And as I said, I'm not really going to do the analysis. I'll call it a claim or an exercise, but I think it's intuitive. I'll say a few words about it. What you can prove, first of all, this is uh, correct in the sense that like this eventually does get a pebble onto u, and therefore this global algorithm eventually gets pebbles on onto all of capital P. So it does the job, but we need to worry about is how many pebbles get used. But here's the, the main fact. If every path in G avoiding uh, P, or avoiding don't delete in the general case, has length at most, let's say, little l, then you know, when you call depth first pebble, it uh, uses at most uh, c times l plus the cardinality of don't delete plus one pebbles. Okay? So the don't delete, you're going to have to pay this much. You're, you're never like, getting rid of these pebbles. You won't, pay, you won't ever get rid of those. Roughly speaking, OK, roughly speaking, what's going on in this algorithm, right? Here you have u, and you basically are going to get a pebble onto all its predecessors. So like, you're paying c right there, the maximum integree. And to answer you this question, there's another place where you can use the fact that the graph has a bounded integree. And like, so you kind of spawn potentially c pebbles here. But like recursively, they also, each one of those guys spawns like c pebbles. And each one of those guys like spawns c pebbles. Um, but this you know, chain can only go back like script L length before you hit something that's in don't delete, which is like you already have a pebble there. So maybe that was more like a hint to how you can complete the exercise than like a genuine proof. But it's really like one paragraph or maybe max two paragraphs inductive proof. Yes? When you say you don't delete? Yeah, I guess. Uh, you mean a source? Oh, don't delete has p in it. OK, sorry. No. Yeah. So basically what happens is, right, like in the global algorithm, like first you try to get a, a pebble on p, or the first guy in p. So like it has like a bunch of paths back here. And like by assumption of p, right, like all these paths that get back to like sources have length at most capital L. So basically you need like L times c to get a pebble here. And then like, when you're pebbling, let's say, this guy, it has like a bunch of paths that go back. And now either any path like eventually going back terminates either here, and then you're like, I can stop this recursion now because I already have a pebble here. Or it goes all the way back to the source, and that's fine. You can pebble the source with one. 
Um, but like this still says that like any of these, either of these kinds of paths will have length at most L. And same thing here. So it is important that you do it like topologically in the order of P. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I don't understand like what happened in the C then L, but then why does the following doesn't work? So let's say I want to put a bubble there. So I have at most C predecessors. Uh -huh. That's perfect. And then for each of that W, I have uh, some pass of lens at most L. So I fill that pass with L bubbles, then put a bubble on W, and then remove all those. And in this way, I get like C plus L. Uh, you have to worry about the difficulty of pebbling those paths. Like, maybe here's U. Let's think about this, because I mean, this is like the key point of the proof. Uh, has some predecessors. Maybe this is W. Now, eventually, like, you're going to have to get your pebble on W, like, spawned from, like, some source that you put on. And it could have, like, many paths to it. And, like, these paths to it may have, like, different lengths, and they could actually, you know, somehow intersect each other. Um, and it'll be, like, hard work to, like, shift the pebble along all these paths. So, so, the, so actually, every path that does not interfere with don't delete has lands at most L, right? Yes. And I already have a pebbles on all don't delete vertices. Yeah. We can imagine, let's say we're working on like the first guy in P, and so like we're not using the fact that we already have P pebble. We're just using the fact that we can do a source for free. Okay. Did you have a comment? You take a C tree, that'll answer the question. I see, yeah, so like a tree is a good one to think about. So let me draw a tree upward with CB3. So let's take a look at what goes on here. Actually, um, yeah, tree is a good thing to think about. A tree you can always do, I believe, with log of V uh, pebbles. That's for any tree, not necessarily a regular one. Maybe it'll be obvious for a regular tree. Um, let's see, so if we want to pebble this guy, all the paths leading up to have depth 2, like 2. So we got to get, like, we're going to have to get pebbles here, here, and here. But not simultaneously, right? Simultaneously, yeah, because in order to pebble this guy, we have to get these guys. No, right, but like, I mean, I can get the leftmost pebble first, and then the lead, and then the second pebble first, etc. So it's just, I need just, what, 6? Right. Um, let's see. In this specific case, you'll have to like maybe pebble, 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 pebble. Yeah. You've used four. You've got something here. Yeah. And then uh, you'll do one, two, three. Yeah. So you'll have five. So at, at the last step, you'll have this guy. Let's imagine there's, at the last step, you'll have a pebble here, a pebble here, and you'll have to use four more pebbles to get this guy. So like if this fanon is C, but the depth is two, right, you'll have to get C minus one, pebbles to cover these guys, plus another C. So it'll be like 2C. But if the depth is 3, it's the same, right? Well, let's see. If the depth is 3, <laughs> basically, you need 2C. We've kind of decided you need 2C to get, to get a pebble here, right? But like, we just analyzed this, and we thought there was 2C to get a pebble here. So now you only need 2C to get a pebble here. And 2C to get a pebble here, but you can reuse it. But at this point, you'll be using up C pebbles. And then when you get the last guy, you'll need 2C. So I guess you'll need 3C to get this guy. So like to get these guys, you know, you get these guys somehow, but you have to use like C minus 1 pebbles to like store here. Then to get this last guy, you'll need 2C more pebbles. You'll need 3C to get this guy. And if there's one more depth, right, then like you can say, well, uh, I need C minus one pebbles to get uh, just getting all the predecessors except the last one here is C minus one. Then I got to get this thing, which is the thing we just analyzed that cost us three C. So this will cost me like four C. Yeah, so I think you can even get something like C minus one times depth minus one or something. But and that's just. Um, I think that's basically the analysis that goes into the uh, inductive proof of this step source pebbling. Yeah. Good. All right. Perfect. We have ten minutes left. Uh, but you know, this is this is basically it. Um, well, I'll say one more thing. But 
Um, let's see, hopefully if you find this believable now. Uh, this is that analysis we kind of just talked about, plus, you know, you're always saving these pebbles that are like in P, that's going to cost you some more. So overall, you're going to use cardinality of P. So yeah, so overall, the number of pebbles this strategy uses is cardinality of P, which was order V over log V times log log V, plus uh, C, which is a constant, order one, times L, which is the max path length, which is this, which is C, uh, this is also order V over log V. So the overall number of pebbles used is like V over log V times this log log V. The pebbling strategy that gets rid of this log log V is totally different looking. <laughs> um, but this is nice. Okay, now the denouement. Um, that more or less completes the proof, except remember what we were doing. This was like the pebbling strategy for the low space simulator, the T over log T space simulator of this machine. Uh, and there is a strategy for this machine to use that it only needs to keep like V over log V different contents around at any time, which that log V is the key savings. We assumed it could know the, what's the graph by just trying all possible graphs, but it also needs to know the pebbling strategy. That's the last piece of the puzzle. Question? Yeah, so the algorithm gets rid of the log log v. Yeah. Does that apply better depth reduction theorem? No, it doesn't do it by uh, depth reduction. I think the depth reduction theorem is tight. Uh, I think. Uh, so it doesn't. I don't actually, I didn't fully 100% read the proof, but um, the first proof they gave is kind of non-constructive, like, and there's like mostly constructive proofs, but I don't really know how they work. I found this proof and I was like, that's satisfactory to me. Okay, so final issue is, uh, is that the low space simulator needs to know the needs to know the pebbling strategy. It has G and it's explicitly written down. Now one trouble, you know, that makes this thing a little bit tricky is that it cannot just write down the strategy because the strategy, I mean, the naive way to write down the strategy just tells you all the sequence of moves, but there could be exponentially many moves, and exponential in V, uh, which is like two to the n to the one third or something. So like uh, two to the t to the one third. So let me just say that recall, strategy could have length you know, like exponential in V. Um, still, in some sense, we want the low space simulator to compute the strategy, but just to understand what that means, what it needs to be able to do is, given a current pebble position, it has to know, like, what is the next pebble move to make in the optimal strategy that it's doing. Okay, so for that, it doesn't potentially need to have the whole strategy written down, it just needs to always know what to do next. So it needs to maybe record what position the game is in right now, that's fine, there are only v pebbles, which is like uh, t to the one third, and maybe to write them down is maybe t to the one third times log v or something, but that's fine. Uh, so how uh, can the simulator do this? I think there are fundamentally two different ways to do, solve this. Solution one to this dilemma is, I think, just check all the details. What do I mean by that? I, I didn't do this, but I, I think you can do this, which is that this strategy I presented actually in contrast to the original proof is like completely constructive and like it's not that complicated. So like this is the, like the, the protocol and uh, there's also the issue of how it knows like what is capital P, like what edges to cut. You have to remember how the proof of lemma well, homework one works. It's not that complicated. You have to find the lengths of these longest paths in the graph. So what I'm saying here is I believe that this like proof is like constructive enough that like if you just like sat down for a while and like really checked everything, I think you could just check that the low space simulator could keep track of what pebble positions it's in and understand like what pebble position to go to next in like O twiddle V space. And this is fine. This is like O twiddle of T to the one third, which is much less than what we're finally shooting for, which is T over log T. That's solution one. 
I think solution one works, but I didn't fully think it through. It seemed plausible to me without checking all the details. Um, but I didn't fully think it through because there's also solution two, which I'll now tell you. And this is the solution that's used in the original paper. And in the, as I said, in the original paper, they used a different pebbling strategy, which has some non-constructive aspects, um, which is why they came up with solution two. But I think solution one is fine. Um, anyway, uh, two, basically any, uh, any graph that has a P pebble strategy can be computed, I put computed because you don't like literally, again, you don't literally write down all the moves, but you can kind of compute the next move function, computed in um, non-deterministic space, uh, P, maybe P log P, because the log P is you gotta like write down the positions of some pebbles, or maybe log V, let's say log V. Basically just enough space so that you can write down the current position, P pebbles and their positions is just log V. And I won't exactly say what I mean here, but it's kind of basically clear, like the, the strategy now, deterministically is you're at a certain pebble position, you just guess what move to do next. You like either guess, oh, I'll remove some pebble or I'll place a pebble. And um, as long as there is some p-pebble strategy that works in getting to the sink, like some sequence of guesses will like let you get there. So if we were going for a non-deterministic space upper bound, we'd be done. This is like v to the one-third log v, or t to the one-third log v. But uh, we're still done because of Savage's theorem. So this is actually a fact. This is Savage's theorem. So if you don't remember what is Savage's theorem, uh, well, it's, uh, it's this. N space S is contained in space S squared. Uh, now, really, it's not immediately clear what I'm saying here because this is like a, a class of uh, languages, all the languages are computed in space S by a non-deterministic machine. This is also a class of languages, uh, all the ones that can be computed in space S squared by a deterministic machine. I'm not really computing a language here, I'm like computing like the next step function in a pebble strategy, but the ideas that go into this, you can just immediately use here. So let me remind you also a tiny bit of the details here. Um, this is Savage's theorem, it's not too hard. It's basically um, saying that if you have a graph with, um, in a graph with two to the s vertices, you can check if two, two vertices are connected. You can't even read this, but anyway, in s squared space, so if you just use like depth first search or breadth first search like you normally do when you're checking if two vertices are connected, like you might write like a bit of information for every vertex in the graph. But there's some kind of uh, space efficient way to do graph searching, which is like middle first search. And it only needs the amount of space, which is like the square of the amount of space to write down a vertex name. And that's Savage's theorem, which is how you prove non-deterministic space S is in space S squared. If you don't remember it, you can look at Sipser or Aurora Barak. Anyway, it basically shows that like, as long as a pebble strategy exists using p pebbles, you can find it, you can find the next move function in space p squared. And this p, p is like v to the one-third, so this is all like o twiddle t to the two-thirds, which is a lot smaller than what you're shooting for, t over log t. So ultimately we just needed, for, if you're gonna use this trick, you just need the v is like a little bit less than square root of t, which is um, fine. But I think you actually don't even need this trick for our way of doing the proof. Okay, any questions? Can you repeat the argument for why does that strategy work in M-space be lovely? Um, basically, the, the, the strategy for a non-deterministic space machine is it only ever really needs to write down like the current position of all the pebbles, which is this much space, and then to do the next step in the strategy, it'll just guess from among all the legal moves it can make one to do, like either remove a pebble, pebble or put a pebble in a place that it could go. So all the time it's only maintaining like a set of at most p-pebble positions, which is this much space, and the, the, the observation is if there exists a p-pebble strategy for getting uh, a pebble on the sink using at most p-pebbles, 
then there will be some sequence of guesses. It's like saying there is some sequence of moves it can do that will get it to the end. And so that kind of implicitly defines a graph with like two to the this many vertices, like all the positions and like the, the edges are the legal moves. And like to say that there is a p-pebble strategy is to say that there is a path in this two to the p log v size graph that gets you from the initial state to like a winning state. And the point is you can find such paths and graphs or check if they exist in deterministic space that's like the square of this by middle first search rather than breadth or depth first search. Okay, see you on Thursday. There's a new homework. On Thursday, we're going to talk about less difficult subjects, circuits.